My name is Tanya Bosak and I'm an associate professor of geobiology here at Ips at MIT and I'm interested in the parallel evolution of life and the environment through geologic history, especially during times when most life was microbial. Uh, I did my undergraduate uh, in geophysics and physics in Croatia at Zagreb University. And then I went to graduate school at Caltech in geobiology. I was the first geobiologist to graduate from that program. Then I came to Boston uh, to do a postdoc at Harvard as a microbial sciences initiative fellow. And well, the job opened up at MIT and that's why I came here. I always wanted to study something at the inter interface of physical and biological processes and particularly something that could have global relevance. And uh, what I study now I think is a perfect example of that. We are trying to reconstruct the history of an entire planet based on a couple of rocks and some lab experiments trying to understand what microbes can do and then look for signatures of similar processes in rocks. Most of the rocks that I study are carbonates, so I can show you a couple yeah, of examples. So for example, here is a beautiful example of a stromatolite. This is a laminated rock that has a slightly weird shape with these bumps, and uh, microbes are thought to influence the shape of these rocks, and similar rocks can be preserved in strata that are as old as 3.5 billion years. And so by looking at these types of rocks, we are trying to ask the question of what microbes were doing at that time. So this is one example. These are, these are rocks made of calcium carbonate, so limestone, dolomite sometimes. I'm interested in really the parallel evolution of life in the environment through three, the first three billion years since the first signs of life on the surface of this planet and this is a very long time so my research focuses on uh, really three major uh, areas. One of them is trying to understand some of the shapes of sedimentary rocks that microbes can uh, influence. So these are these laminated rocks called stromatolites and trying to understand not only how microbes can influence the shapes of rocks but how we can use the record of these shapes and figure something out about the environment, the chemical environment during that time, which was very, very different than the environment today. So we are really looking at planetary evolution on a planet that has life on top of everything else. Um, and some of the other areas I'm focusing on are somewhat younger, so these rocks, stromatolites, cover uh, the time from about 3.5 to about 0.5 billion years and I'm also focusing on a time that is somewhat younger so from about 1 billion to about 0.5 billion years and looking for the first evidence of, of eukaryotic life so life of organisms that are like us they have a nucleus they can make some shells they can make multicellular uh, structures such as for example algae and I'm looking for signatures of that life and I'm using some of these fossils we find in rocks to uh, understand something about the cycling of carbon during this time because this is a time when things are coming into their own, the oceans are coming into their own and changing quite a bit. So, uh, my lab, what we really I think do uh, what we specialize in is taking modern microbes and torturing them in all sorts of ways <laughs> to address hypotheses that arise from the record. So we see rocks with weird shapes and we can hypothesize, oh, this is why they have a shape X or Y. And then we can uh, grow microbes in the lab and expose them to different conditions and see how they really behave according to our hypothesis. So really testing. Uh, the ranges of microbial behaviors under conditions that are not necessarily found on modern day earth and uh, taking these insights to explain the record. So this is so to that end we culture a lot of microbes, uh, we analyze these microbial communities, we analyze their geochemical signatures, so sometimes we analyze, uh, we really 
connect physiology of these microbes to their geochemical signatures. For example, in, some collab in collaboration with my colleague Shuhei Ono, we look at sulfur isotopes that certain microbial processes uh, discriminate among and uh, re relate these, bi these signatures to what is happening in microbial cells, or we relate shapes of rocks to how microbes behave under certain conditions, uh, or really just extract fossils from rocks and study them. We are trying to find uh, some general principles of uh, how microbes can shape sedimentary rocks. So if one is to explain shapes that are really preservable, meaning somewhat larger, how can one in a predictable way uh, say if you have certain types of microbes that behave in certain way and certain types of environments, what kinds of shapes can one expect? What kinds of sizes, for example, of these stromatolites, what kinds of columnar sizes, or whether should, they should be conical or mushroom-shaped. Um, so what we've been able to explain is the shapes and sizes of certain conical stromatolites through time. These stromatolites were really, really common on the early Earth and uh, driven out, and they really occur in modern hot springs and nowhere else. Uh, so this is one of the findings, and we are currently trying to understand some of the finer structures and textures of these rocks and look for the first uh, evidence in rocks for oxygenic photosynthesis. So here we are talking about textural evidence instead of geochemical evidence that occurs later, clearly. Photosynthesis has to evolve, operate for some time, and then uh, one can see oxygen accumulate. Uh, second, we found some examples of the first major groups of eukaryotes in the rock record, for example, the first ciliates that were um, preserved in carbonate rocks, so these limestones from Mongolia that are about 700 million years old. So one can start finding examples of organisms that look very much like modern ones and documenti documenting the rise of diversity in the biosphere at that time. Uh, and we've um, found some um, intriguing uh, biosignatures of uh, sulfate reduction, meaning we've uh, discovered some of the large discriminations of sulfur isotopes during microbial processes that were larger than previously thought. And uh, now we are trying to understand what conditions lead to these types of isotopic signatures. That Ultimately, our record is limited. The further back you go, the fewer rocks there are. So really, sometimes you make claims about the entire planet based on one rock, which <laughs> I think we are all aware of. And this is, I think it comes down to how comfortable, what kinds of levels of uncertainty one can be comfortable with. Uh, so that's one more philosophical type of challenge. Uh, I think really what we are moving into driven by some of our findings is trying to understand more about the Neoproterozoic, so this time from about 1 billion years ago to about 540 million years ago. Um, and this is, I think, the really a really beautiful example of a planet where life and biological changes may be driving some of the geochemical signatures and huge oscillations that one starts observing. And uh, so life during that time probably drove the rise of oxygen. Uh, really weird events in the cycling of carbon. And so tying that in some way together, or at least trying to explain it a little better, I think it will be a challenge. And this in turn has consequences for the cycling of modern carbon and understanding the differences I think is fundamentally just to understand the fundamental balances and dynamics in the cycles of carbon and oxygen. So geobiology is a I love it as a field because it involves collaborations with so many different people even its name is geology and biology in one so one has to understand biological processes of course but it has one has to understand the record and the nature of it and the potential to record something that I mean, oftentimes I'll be looking at single genes, something that may never have any signatures in the rock record. So we have to really understand how to bridge these. And then in turn, uh, 
I talk to a lot of people in uh, uh, climate, people who are really interested in fundamental controls between oxygen and carbon. So modern day carbon cycle is just one reflection, one aspect of what could have been going on through geologic history. So one, by looking at, I think, deep time, learns to appreciate the complexity of the system even more. And uh, of course, there are all sorts of collaborations with material science scientists um, and scientists who really know how to look at rocks. So people who go to the field and put all of these rocks in context, data, date them, and understand what came earlier or later, and interpret the types of depositional environments that these rocks are from, because this is critical for anyone who cares about biosignatures and knowing what type of sedimentary environment this life existed in. So I think it's a wonderful discipline for anyone who wants to work at the interface. It is certainly uh, something that, it, the aspect that I've enjoyed most, talking to all of these different people.